In Focus is powered in part by Go Chevrolet at I-25 and the Boulder Turnpike. Your source for new or used cars and trucks and reliable service for most makes and models. Just visit GoAutoChevrolet.com. Welcome to In Focus with Eden Lane. On tonight's special edition, we make a return visit to the Aurora Fox for the production of Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson. This determined company has finally opened after suffering a dramatic setback on their original opening night. Here's a special report from John Moore. Tonight, in preparations for opening of Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson, we had an accident. Uh, ben Dickey, producer and star of the show, had an accident. Ben was bringing his playbills from the main lobby across the stage, across the main stage, through the green room back into the studio. At, at the same moment, a uh, technician had gone down into the trap, pulling out letters to go on the marquee tonight, and uh, uh, literally, they're Paths crossed for a second, and it was at the wrong time. As he came up, then that was open. That's where he went down. We begin tonight with producer, director, and star Ben Dickey. So this is our second visit with Ben Dickey Productions for Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson, and the reason we're here again is because the first time we were here, we thought it was just going to be smooth sailing to bring us this wonderful musical that hardly anybody has seen. Yet something happened. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if I thought it was going to be smooth sailing, <laughs> but I, I, I certainly thought it was going to be easier than it ended up being. Um, yeah. So, what was it? Two hours before we were supposed to open, I fell through a trap door just thirty feet away, and uh, we didn't do a show that night. <laughs> no. But your tenacious company and you um, stuck to it, and even though your your opening was delayed, we're still here. I, seeing you do this. That word's amazing to me, tenacious, and I think I think it aptly describes the company. Um, ho hopefully, I, I always bring that to everything I do, but, but certainly feeling, when I came back on Sunday after the accident to talk to them, feeling the kind of outpour of love mm -hmm. and desire for the show and passion to see it go forward, I mean, that just fueled, I think it fueled my recovery, honestly. It's tempting for someone who doesn't know you and doesn't know um, theater companies in town to have thought casually that perhaps this was a vanity production, <laughs> you know, because it's Ben Dickey Presents and you're the star and you're the director. But if it were a vanity production, you couldn't have overcome that incident, that, that tragedy. I mean, that's an overused word, but it really was, it, it's that quintessential Broadway story of opening night, hours before curtain. So what is it that drew you to this material that made it so important to bring this to us? Well, I, I think there's a lot of things, and, and I think you're right. I mean, when I set out to produce it, um, I immediately thought of a couple of guys to play the lead role. I immediately started to think of, you know, who might direct it. Maybe that's me. Maybe that's some other friends. And, and courted a lot of people along the way. But, but what I knew, what I knew definitely is that I wanted the role of producer because I thought, a show of this magnitude, a show with this much, uh, with this fabulous writing, this amazing score, and certainly the political overtones um, were just something that, that I was drawn to as much as I've been drawn to really any piece of dramatic literature. You had to create a company so that you could do it rather than trying to convince a, an established theater to do it. Right. I think, um, I think we knew that, and when I say we, I, I think I knew that it was going to take a certain amount of license to really pull it off, mm -hmm. and, that, and that constraints that were put on me maybe from outside forces weren't going to really jive. Like what? Um, well, uh, the, show's, the show's very polarizing mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, and, and um, it, it can be seen as offensive, although our audience hasn't necessarily found it that way. They found it, I think, more intriguing, but... I think you can find 
components or moments in this show offensive and still enjoy it and appreciate it because it's it's supposed to be poking you in the eye like that. Right, exactly. This type of show wanted to have a certain aesthetic value because when I saw the show originally, the aesthetic value so closely mirrored my own mm -hmm. um, that I wanted to have really free artistic license over it. And, and, and I, you know, I've obviously directed four theaters a lot and, and, and with other people, and you know, there, there are a lot of contributing factors. And, and while I consider myself a collaborative theater maker, and have certainly had amazing collaborators on this process, I also knew that I wanted to see every part of my artistic vision fulfilled. Is that why you ultimately decided to, to cast yourself as Andrew Jackson? Um, <laughs> I think we decided to cast me, and it was a decision made um, by not only myself, but, but certainly my music director, my choreographer, my production manager. Mm -hmm. um, I think we ultimately decided to do that because we knew that it was an acting role mm -hmm. who had to sing, and most of the people we brought in were missing some of the colors that they needed as actors. Um, what is it like to star in it, produce in it, and direct it? <laughs> what is uh, that like for you? It's so interesting. Um, it's so interesting to be in a scene and see things happen around you and think about things. And you know, as a director, you're always watching the show and watching rehearsal. Even while you're in the scene. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but as a director, even from the outside, you're watching and you're thinking, OK, what notes do I give today? What do I tell the actor today? What am I going to tell the actor tomorrow? What am I going to tell them in a week? Right? Because a, a good director sort of leads the actor down the path and wants them to go. I'm giving away a lot to my cast right now <laughs> <laughs> and future actors who work under me. Yeah. But, <laughs> but you don't ever overwhelm the actor with, with, all, with your whole vision for the show. Um, so it was interesting because I had to do a lot of work to, to remember what are the things I really need to hit today? What are the things now that we've run the scene with me in it um, mm -hmm. that I really need to hit on? How do I push actors today? And, and at the end of the day, how do I push myself today? Mm -hmm. um, because you know the notes are basically for myself just coming from inside my head. Now, having said that, <laughs> going back to collaboration, having a choreographer and a musical director and a stage manager who are so bought in. You had a safety in, net there. A safety net, exactly. And, and um, basically a stand-in who, who could walk the patterns and I could step out and watch, oh, what, is, what does the stage picture look like? Or you know, what is the composition of the scene, which is obviously important. That brings us very nicely to you know, how we got to that first visit with you. All that work and planning and the passion that, that made you want to bring this incredibly subversive, fun, rock and roll musical to us. But then just before you were able to, to do so, you had that horrible accident. And of course, after you set aside your personal safety, what was the first thing going through your mind when we saw you in John Moore's report sitting in that hospital bed? What were you thinking? You know, I, I was certainly disappointed. Um, I mean, probably overwhelmingly so, but Oddly enough, I, I, I really felt a lot more concerned for, you know, the folks who were, who were planning on coming to opening. Um, there was this other extenuating circumstance where, where my girlfriend's grandma had died hours earlier. Mm. And so I just, I kept saying, call, call Emily, somebody call Emily, I need to talk to Emily, tell her everything's okay, tell her I'm fine. And, and this other idea of getting the word out to, to loved ones that, you know, I'm okay. It, it hurt like it hurts like hell, and and I feel like I can't move or breathe. But but at the end of the day, I'm okay. And so, I don't know. I I, I guess part of me wanted to still manage the situation, um, even even when you were, because they took a long time to get you out to make sure it was safe. Yeah. So even when you were still laying there in that pit. Yeah. You were when I came down to the bottom and I was laying there and I I clearly. They kept saying you had the wind knocked out of you, and I thought, well, it feels more severe than that. Mm -hmm. um, but my thought was, man, if I could just get to my feet, maybe, maybe I could figure out some way to, to work through this pain. I also had the thought of, if I could just take one good breath, mm -hmm. one good breath, then I could relax and, and find a way to move past this, and again, get back to managing the situation. It never happened. <laughs>
So uh, after we knew you were safe, and we knew that the extent of your injuries was as severe as it was, there was a time period where you had to decide as a company, as a producer, how to move forward or if to move forward. Tell me about that. Well, the company, uh, like all great theater professionals, went to work. Um, Doing what? Figuring out how does the show go forward without Ben? Mm -hmm. um, because you had someone marking your spots, but not oh, necessarily learning yeah, your role. Yeah, I mean Andrew uh, Deesner, who's our bass player. Um, I had talked to him a long time before about about understudying the role in that way that you know I can step out and and look at the show. And I said to him, I said, Andrew, you'll never go on <laughs> because, <laughs> because if it's not, I'd have to be dead. In, in, a, in, a, in a, especially in a production this small, not only is it not required that you have understudies for major roles. But often it's not feasible to have understudies because there's extra cost associated with that, um, extra responsibility for the standby actor. So it's not unusual for you not to have had a, right. a real understudy. Right, exactly. And, and so, you know, the company came together and they said, oh, yeah, we're going to do this. And, and Andrew immediately started memorizing the role and he was ready to go. Um, but the other thing we're faced with is I'm a union actor. Mm -hmm. And because of our agreement with equity, I technically need a union actor to replace To replace me. you. Otherwise... Uh, our agreement with them becomes in jeopardy and some other things, um, you know, fall away. And, and so that was another piece of the decision where we started looking at it and we're going, well, <laughs> the guy's not around, you know. Um, and so then Sunday night, uh, the cast was having a rehearsal and, you know, I, I told my sister, I said, I really, really want to be there. Um, and. I, I Just two days later, two you days were later. able to come and be with them? Well, I got released in the morning, so... Um, but still. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think I look very good walking in. <laughs> <laughs> the guests could tell you more about that, but... Um, you probably really freaked them I, out. <laughs> I felt really good. <laughs> probably because I wasn't feeling much. Um, but uh, it was one of those... Um, moments where where we were able to take time to sort of grieve together the loss of opening. That's um, important that you say it exactly that way. The kind of work that you all invested in that compressed time period. Some of these people you've worked with many, many times before. Some you may not have worked with ever. You, you have to shed all of the outside world to, to do it in that short time frame. Yeah. So there must have been some real grieving. Tell me about that. Yeah. Um, I, I, <laughs> there was this amazing moment where um, Andrew was ready. He was learning the role. He had he had memorized half the script in two days. Um, we had gotten a new bass player, and and you know after talking, because I had had a couple conversations before I talked to the cast about what maybe we wanted to do, and the bass player came up, and and I'd never met this guy, um, the substitute, the substitute bass player. I never met him, and and he was saying, you know, I don't know you. Um, and the work is nice, but it feels like you have a family here and mm. that you want to move forward as a family. Um, and of course, you know, I just, I, I, that was all I could handle. And um, I, I think uh, what was neat was I was able to come in the next day and have a production meeting and somehow felt 10 times better. And so as we were looking at dates anywhere from, you know, three weeks out to January. Pushing After the, the election, which was an important time period, you wanted to, to run the show in. Mm -hmm. And even when we said September 27th, the worry was, well, you're going to lose a lot of momentum. And I said, well, what about a week before that, you know? And, and, and so that was always kind of a goal. The sneak preview on Saturday night was always like, if we could, if we could make that happen, if we could really show people that we're doing something, uh, then maybe maybe we'll survive. You had some interesting support from the creators of this work during that time period. Yeah, that was amazing. I mean, the the outpouring of love from the community was was overwhelming. Um, here in Denver. Here in Denver, uh, all over. Um, just you know friends in New York who'd heard about it from friends and friends in Chicago, my theater home, who had heard about it and texts and tweets and calls and Seeing visits you on the in internet. the hospital. And then, <laughs> yeah. And then I get a call from um, the marketing director of the Fox and she says, there's some flowers here from you from an Alex Timbers. And I, I was 
like, what? And I said, oh, please take a picture of those and send them. Because um, I was, I, I couldn't make it in that day. And um, Alex I, Timbers. I, I, Alex Timbers, who wrote the show and who, who just won a Tony this last year for Peter and the Star Catcher and who is really blowing up as a theater maker mm -hmm. on the Broadway scene and, um, and who aesthetically I really admire having seen uh, now a lot of his work. I have no idea how he found out mm -hmm. um, other than, you know, I, I, I think he's been following the show and, mm -hmm. and keeping his eye on things. But to have somebody, to have somebody who is just, you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that if you're, if you're a Broadway star. Care about somebody who's producing your show re regionally. That same day, I got a, a basket of cards from all the kids I teach. I teach drama at a school, um, and every kid in that school made me a card. And so, by the end of that day, I was. What down. are the ages? What's the age range of that? Uh, a pre kindergarten through twelve or through eighth grade, pre kindergarten through eighth grade. Hmm. What was your reaction to that? Oh, I was. I came unglued. Yeah. I mean. It, you know, just sifting through all of them and seeing all their names and get well soon, Ben. And you know, they they didn't know the severity of the, of, of the injury, but they took the time out of their day sure. to love me. So from the night that you saw it in New York, uh, obviously you had a similar reaction to mine, except maybe yours was more intense because you produced it. Uh, it was I, I walked out of there vibrating. Obviously you did too. Yeah. Through all of this, to now you're finally open. With some changes, mm -hmm. but you're finally open. Have you been able to take that deep breath yet? Yeah, yeah. You know that that sneak preview Saturday night. Uh, I came off stage after um, my favorite scene in the play, which is a scene with Black Fox, the Indian that um, Andrew Jackson eventually betrays, mm -hmm. a friend of his. And um, and I, 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 there was just this flood of emotion, um, and I think it was really a, a release of the last six months of worry and pain and frustration and fear um, yeah. and hard work and support, <laughs> um, all, all of those things uh, that you go through as an artist when, when I think you're, you're really striving to make good art. I think all those emotions sort of came to the surface and I wasn't able to, um, to hold them back and I think it was good. And one of the actors backstage looked at me and, you know, I don't know if they thought maybe I was really just in pain, um, and I just kept saying, "No, no, it's good, it's good, it's 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 all good tears." Well, I'm glad you had good tears. I'm I'm so thrilled that I got to be here on your eventual opening night, and I want to meet these amazing people that stuck with you and helped you do this. They are pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now we get to meet several of the artists in this determined and tight knit cast. We met with them only two days after their new opening. Well, here we are. You're finally open. The work that goes into creating a musical is always emotional, and when it's done well, the company always gels and turns into a cohesive unit. But you had this amazing misfortune <laughs> on your opening night. How did that impact you as, as not just an artist and a member of this cast, but as a person. What, how did you cope with that? It was kind of like, like you went into shock, but it's not like, you know, somebody died shock. It's like, but it's still shock. So it was like a day and then I was like, mm -hmm. whoa, did that really happen? And it sounds cliche, doesn't it? Yeah. On opening night, the star <laughs> of the show falls <laughs> through the stage. Mm -hmm. um, whenever I arrived, um, my heart just sunk. Um, because obviously I could see that something was wrong and when you see three fire trucks mm -hmm. uh, surrounding the place it can't be good at that point you just become it's it's just human you you need to know that everything's all right um, you know I wasn't mm -hmm. even worried about the, the show. show did all of you find out before what would have been your call time or did you find out as you arrived for your call time it was all a little different some of us uh, got here afterwards uh, a few of us were here as it happened because your call time typically is around an hour before for a musical for exactly. warm-up right yeah. yeah and and it was opening night so some of us were here early either helping finish up a few yeah. things or or just kind of getting into the mood and just getting things ready a few of us were here I know the ones who were here we were all of a sudden just told 
Ben got hurt. Uh, don't worry about it. Go sit in the green room for a little while. So we were just kind of sitting in the green room and slowly as people came in, we just collectively pulled them into the room and we all just kind of sat there waiting for news. So when you're all together in the green room and you finally fi they finally get him out of that hole and you know he's off to the, to the hospital, what, what are you saying to each other? Nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. There was, yeah. <laughs> like, we just watched him and then it was quiet. It was just, we were just so struck with sadness. And, you know, I, a lot of people, a lot of us did get there early because we had so much energy and we were just ready. Like, because we knew we had worked so hard mm -hmm. in three weeks' time. That's what amazed us, I think, as a cast um, the most. So we were just excited for people to see it finally. And so, you know, when that didn't happen, we just, we didn't know what to do other than be with each other. Because of course, like you said, your first inclination is to, as a human being, as a family member almost, to, to be concerned about a member of your family. Mm -hmm. But there's also that you were geared up for a show. It was your opening night, all that energy and emotion. What do you do with that when something like that happens? We drink. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we all felt lost. Like we didn't, our leader, our rock, our, you know, the person that held us together was gone to tell us what to do and we all just sort of sat and looked at each other wondering what's next what where do we go from here I didn't even say anything yeah there was you just we just yeah we were lost mm -hmm. we were actually we were released they said okay well you can go home because we're not going to do a show and we all just we stayed sat in the green room our stage manager found some wine and we all just toasted to Ben and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sat there sat like there hours. for a couple hours yeah. yeah when were you able to see Ben the first time after that. Uh, Sunday, Sunday night. night. Sunday night. Sunday night. And that was when you already had a plan in place to figure out if you could move forward. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We were pretty much ready to set and come in and put Andrew into the role and be there for him if, you know, we were we were ready, you know, to to do whatever we needed to do to put the show back in, in working order. But we knew something felt wrong. Yeah. It was weird. It was, something wasn't right. When the decision was made to try to bring Ben back in on such an aggressive schedule, considering his injuries, obviously changes had to be made. But there must have been some sense of not just relief that you were going to forward, but was there any fear about whether you could do it? Just for Ben's like safety mm -hmm. a little bit at first, because you know we're like, well, he used to jump off the stage so we're like and now oh. we have a stunt double yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just like things like the fight scene where we're like we it just kind of gets iffy but he told us not to worry about him mm -hmm. so now we've gotten out of that now but it took a while so opening night was just a few days ago mm -hmm. what was that like I mean I was here and I know it was like for me but I'm observing all of you and there was there's always a, a wonderful energy on opening night. Mm -hmm. But this opening night, I mean, for the first half of the night, I was digging my <laughs> nails into my own legs. <laughs> so what was it like for you? I think we got that feeling out during our preview. We kind of felt that way during the yeah. preview. So, and like Ben was saying earlier, it was so great that we had that preview because come opening night, we were ready to go. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it, we had that same momentum that we had on the 7th when we were all here, you know. And, it was, it was amazing. We finally, you know, like I said, we were finally open. And after all, everything that happened, we, we did it, you know, and now we're doing it. And Even if somebody didn't know the, the unique stage drama story that <laughs> happened <laughs> to this production and to this company, if they just came in and saw the production, your work is exciting. I mean, you guys rock. <laughs> you really do. Thank you, you have taken this material. There have been some really interesting changes, like like when you shift from one dress to another, it seems different to me. I don't know if I'm off or not, maybe because I only saw it once before, but it seems like it's different, and there's lots of little things that make it yours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. We shift, we shift, we shift into um, the more modern, contemporary. contemporary dress sooner than they did on the, in Broadway. But it seems to make sense, but it did it seem different. It's, mm -hmm. it, came, it came from Ben. It's where he felt that shift happening, and we just kind of went with it, and it makes sense. For, for Especially because I've never seen it, you know, so I don't really have anything to go off of. I don't mm -hmm. know, you know, so um, 
again, we just, we made it our own. Ben made it his own and we made it together. And you guys as a company have made a similar shift from your first opening to that setback to now your opening. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that we got to see this. I, I know everybody in Colorado really should come and see you because it's not just a wonderful backstage theater story, but you guys are really doing good work. What does that feel like to know that there's those two levels upon which people are watching you, that they're looking for your good work, but they're also looking at you because of this drama that surrounds your company? They can come for the news story or for the, the watching, trying to see if Ben is going to fall or anything, which of course he's not. <laughs> but as long as they stay and actually see the product that's out there that we put out there for them, they, they, they don't just pay attention to one thing, they see the whole product, then I'd say, doesn't matter why they came as long as they leave with something. Uh, setting aside the news story, there's some good music going on in here. <laughs> there's some good character work. There's some really ho horrible, raunchy humor. <laughs> this is a scandalous show. They really should come and see yeah. you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for letting me visit you again. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. We'll have more personal thoughts from the company on our Facebook page. And here's a preview of Ben Dickey's Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson. I'm Andrew Jackson. I'm your president. Let's go! One, two, three, four! Populism, yeah, yeah! Populism, yeah, yeah! Populism, yeah, yeah! Populism, yeah, yeah! This is the age of Jackson! Visit bloodydenver.com for ticket information for your chance to see Ben Dickey's Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson at the Aurora Fox. That's all for this edition. Remember to join us on Facebook and Twitter. With all that Colorado has to offer, we're here to help you keep it in focus. Thanks for watching. Good night.